So here's the thing. With all the people that come across the world, this is going to be out of the I hope it's not longer than 45 minutes. But um, the difficult part is going to be explaining the assignment to those guys in the camera. Because you guys are going to be up here to look at the websites and look at the things that I'm, I'm referencing. I want you to interact a little bit with what I'm saying. So if you could bring up the Google image search of Color Prism. And what we need to talk about today is how this is the last, I was telling these guys earlier, this is the last technical like assignment. The, the future assignments are going to be technical, but you're going to have a certain savvy, so they're not going to see them as technical. You're going to be able to make more, I want you to make more art projects. Like how can you make art using color theory? Right? What do you know? You know about transparency, you know about pigments, right? You know about how to match color, you know how to make color, right? You, you have a sophistication now that you didn't have before. And so, hey, Ali. I can't believe you're bailing on the boat festival. I just felt like since I missed two days ago. So, well, you're going to like this lecture, it's a good one. So, this, like, this, I think, is the, fun, the most fun assignment. Yeah, put it back there, bud. You look really nice, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that fun of the I saw half the film, so I don't feel like too bad about it. Um, I know. So we worked with pigment, and now we're talking about RGB. RGB, my friends. For those of you who don't know, I don't mean to be didactic, but it means that. Yeah. Put this on there, and then I'll do it. Roy. Some people say Roy G. Bib, right? I don't really. Well, if you look at the prism, what's the spectrum that you see on the color on the website on the on the Google? You see red, green, blue. Now, what other colors are missing? Uh, orange, yellow, and purple. Orange, yellow, purple. But we can account for yellow in what family? Blue. Red family. Oh, okay. What can we account for the purple? The violet. The blues. The blues. And what about um, that other, that other green? The blue, the blue. The green and the yellow are kind of close to each other, right? So green and yellow can go together, but green can go with the blues, and the green can go with the reds. So you see what I'm saying? Um, if you look at this, you can see that the yellow and the green are in the middle, and they can kind of swing both ways. Just like you know in color, they can be warm or they can be cold. That's why they're in the middle. Now, I know I know you guys see this all the time, but did you realize that? That's those colors in the middle, because they can swing to the warm side or the cold side. And we know that all colors can. But those two are really important, right? If you have a cool green or cool green, you had a cool yellow, then you know you can make different kinds of cool things, right? A different, or cool blue, sorry. You know you can make the proper green. So those kind of make sense in the middle because they can swing to the warm and really cool. So the thing you got to know about light, this is, if you remember, this is from Newton. Newton said, hey, I have this prism. I can shoot white light through it, and I get a spectrum of color. Now this is based on light, right? This is light. This doesn't have anything to do with pigment. You guys made pigment color up until this point, right? The only way that light's involved is that the lights come on and they bounce off your colors and then you can see the colors of the pigments, right? Mm -hmm. But you can make color just using light. So when, when um, Newton used the prism to separate out the colors, it was quite genius because then he took another prism and put a hole up to the red to see if there was any other colors in red in their work. So this is the full spectrum. So when you make colors out of the full spectrum, you can get millions and millions and millions of colors. You guys see on monitor sometimes millions of colors, right? But millions of colors still isn't all the colors. Because what do you think's missing from the stuff that's missing from this that your human eye can't see? Your human eye can see red, green, and blue because of the light, right? All those come in on the light wave, on a photon. All the colors mixed in this white light right now. What what's the predominant color in this room if you were to say if you were to pick a color that's kind of getting filtered out? It's white, but there seems to be Yellow, you see yellow? On that wall, I see red. What? I see red. I see red. What do you, like, where do you see yellow? Just point to it. You might be, filtered, might be getting filtered out here. I think it's probably more red. Yeah. Lean towards the red? Yeah, that wall looks red. That one looks kind of pink. Right, that looks a little blue. Could be the color of the paint. Right? Hey, just put it back there. Alright, so. All the colors exist in a photon of light. That's a pretty genius thing. That's how your monitors work. That's how projectors work. That's how TVs work, right? Like, go down the list. I, I know some of you have seen the color test swatch that they use on TV television, on old tube television. Some of you should look it up. Josh, you look it up. Color tube test color swatches. It's basically these colors to see if you got the full spectrum of color coming from your tube. Put back there. Pour it before. You know? Um, so does this make sense? You live in, and you guys live in both these worlds simultaneously. So when you print out a thing on the phaser, what do you have? 
pigment based color. Right? But you're printing it from a what? A light based system. Now, we talked about this a little bit before. You can make millions of colors, or billions probably. You can make millions of colors in this system. This system, it's harder to make millions and millions of colors. You can make thousands of colors, but you, it's really hard to make millions. Why would you say, and I think you guys have had experience, why is it hard to make millions of colors in a pigment-based system? Because <coughs> after a certain point, they'll get money. Like, yeah, lose they lose a certain system. clarity. Yeah. yeah. Because pigment gets messy, right? They get really close in value and you can't discern the value. A computer can numerically tell the difference between a color, right? In a computer system, so if we were using a computer, a computer, this is something you guys didn't necessarily do with your pigment. A computer can add numbers and subtract numbers, right? And numbers, you can go, okay, I want 1% magenta, 2% yellow, 1% black, you know what I mean? And then you can start, you can literally put in a number. You can even go to like 0.2, right? You can add numbers, and numbers, you know, are infinite. Right? So you could theoretically make an infinite amount of colors, but you won't see your eye wouldn't see them. Our eye can only see millions of colors. But there's something missing from our eyes. There's actually more color in the there's more color out there than just the RGB colors coming in on these things. There's other colors. That you could that you would be able to see if you had a rod in your eye that allowed you to see ultraviolet. Your eyes can see RGB, but you can't see ultraviolet. There's different types of ultraviolet. There's hummingbirds that see two different versions of ultraviolet. Pretty crazy. If you look up the Hubble Space Telescope on the internet, look, that's how it takes its pictures. None of those pictures are colored. They come in with an ultraviolet. The computer interprets the ultraviolet. Then they colorize them later. So all the pictures come in black and white because you can't see ultraviolet. So the only way our human eye sees ultraviolet is by seeing it as grayscale. Isn't that goofy? Mm -hmm. So there's actually billions of colors if you start to add the different types of ultraviolet light that are coming in through the, out of the universe, right? Besides light. Pretty crazy. So this system is really a big system. We talked about this before, right? But this is a big color space. And this is a kind of a small color space because you're limited to the pigments, the, the purity of the pigments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, the other thing I need to do is look somebody up right now, or look somebody on the computer. His name is James Turrell, T-U-R-R-E-L. And we've worked this in a little bit. But he's an artist, so I'll write this for the people. James Turrell. He's an artist who works with light as, a, as an artist. He only works with light, not pigment. So, those of you who make, so a filmmaker is technically working in light, right? A photographer, is working in light, but then they might have to, if you're not showing on the computer, if you print if you print those photographs out, then what system are you in again? You're in a pigment-based system, even if you're using silver. Silver is a pigment-based system. Does that make sense, guys? Like, how do you know what, do you guys even think about what color space you're in? Yeah. How, is silver just like metal pigment? Silver is metal pigment, yeah. Like, yeah, that's how photo paper, traditional photo paper, is made with silver. Because silver is light sensitive, in that it would add it with a chemical. Uh, do you guys even think about when you're in a pigment? Now you've been forced to think about pigment, right? Whether you like it or not, you've been forced to think about a pigment color space. But when you're in the computer, do you think about what colors you're using and why you're using them, or do you just grab them? I think it just depends. Like, sometimes I don't think about it, and then when I print it off and it's not that fantastic color, then I get frustrated. <laughs> and so then I'll have to sit yeah. there and think so about it. So you see more. where we're going with this? When you make something, in the computer and you print it in a pigment-based system, how are you going to match it when you have access to all these colors? And this color, this pigment-based system is a limited system, right? Right? This is a limited system. And when we make a color over here that's in the millions of colors, right, we could potentially have something that right runs out of gamut. This is really important because the next assignment that you remember this is being out of gamut is a problem when you're trying to color match. When, you, when you're trying to color match from an RGB system going to a pigment-based system, what happens? It can get goofy. 
Do you know what pigments the phaser company uses, that Xerox uses to make their toner, that, you, that then gets embedded on your paper? Do they have a cool magenta? Do they have a warm magenta? Do, they, do you know? You know what I'm saying? Like, how are you going to know? You're going to have to perform some tests. If you print to the inkjet printer that's out here, um, how do you know if it's a cool-based system or a warm-based system? If you're using a camera, what if you're not even using, uh, what if you're going to go directly from a camera to a, to a pigment-based system, to some kind of printer, to some kind of output device? How do you know whether they're using warm colors or cool colors as their pigments? These are questions you need to ask yourself um, in, the, in this next assignment. And don't worry, I'm going to be talking about those assignments. But does that make sense? Like, these are systems that actually need color matching and color correcting. And this is called, more called color correcting than it is color matching. So believe it or not, look up, so if somebody wants to be brave, look up color matching software. Believe it or not, they sell software where you can attach an eye to your monitor and then attach, uh, then you print out on your inkjet printer or your lit phaser printer and it prints out a bunch of dot of squares and then you take a picture of all those squares and theoretically you can get your printer and your monitor lined up. Because how many of you have noticed that everybody's monitor here looks different? If you're looking at my monitor and their monitor, they're probably different. Mm -hmm. Every monitor is different. So if you're looking at a monitor, how can you trust it? If you look at a monitor and your thing looks really nice and bright and you print it to this system and it looks really dark, what's the problem, do you think? Was it calibrated? Well, I mean, it wasn't calibrated, but what, let's just, let me say it again. If you print out something from an RGB system and on your monitor in the Mac lab and it's nice and bright because of your retina display or whatever, and you print it to the phaser and it looks dark, what's the problem? Sorry? No? Your screen was too light? Your screen is showing colors that are not there or showing darks as light. Yeah. So how do you, do you know what I'm saying? Your screen is making everything look really vibrant, but it prints dark. So what would that mean if it's printing dark? There's something going on in your image in the computer that you can't see because your monitor is so bright. What would you guess be? When you guys make dark colors, what's, what's going on? When you're making your dark pigments, what was, what were you doing? You're adding a lot of color. Mm -hmm. And you're adding a lot of black. And so one of the things you have to realize is that when you're working on the computer, it's crazy how much black is in your image and you don't know it. So how do you deal with that? How do you make sure this, how do you get rid of all this black and all this extra color that's printing dark? in your pigment-based system, but doesn't exist in your in this system because it's so bright. Well, you've got to get rid of the black. You've got to get rid of the black somehow. Now, this color matching software that I mentioned, anybody bring it up? It's goofy. It allows you to tame your monitor down so that you're seeing more accurately the colors. Now, ultimately, they don't work that great. You can, be, you can create a workflow for yourself, but it, guess what? You can even calibrate your digital camera so your digital camera matches your computer numbers, which matches then your printer's numbers. But you have to streamline the system, and they call that color. They call that color correction. You have to, if you correct your camera, if your camera is using the same numbers as your computer and it's the same numbers as your printer, then you're in right. You're matching. But if you're just using your eyeball, you guys have all printed something to an inkjet printer or or the phaser or uh, any kind of printer, and it's been wrong, right? Mm -hmm. that experience. Well, you can kind of get a workflow going for yourself if you calibrate all of your machinery that you. You calibrate your iPhone, you calibrate your computer, you calibrate your printer. But then, what happens if you use another printer? You're not in calibration with it. So what we're, this is the next assignment is going to be about color correction across three systems. A camera, a computer, and a printout.